VHS 
Jesus, keep me true. There is a race I must run. There is a victory to be won. Give me power every hour to be true. This morning we're talking about the leader as a strategist. And as a strategist, we need to be wise. As a strategist, you need to be bold. Because there are some bold decisions that a strategist will take. That the followers and the under shepherds and the under leaders following after him may not understand at the beginning. And that's why you are praying that the Lord will keep you true to the vision. And the Lord will keep you free so that there will be no bondage, there will be no inhibition, there will be no restriction. You will be free to do what the Lord is calling you to do. You will be wise as to develop strategies and you map out things. And it's things that ought to be done, you put them in place. The people that ought to do those things, you're going to put them there. And it's going to take wisdom to put square pegs in square holes. And it's going to demand wisdom to put round pegs in round holes. And we need to be bold. Bold for the Lord. Courageous for the Lord. That's the reason why we sang it. That keep me true, Lord. Keep me free, Lord. Keep me wise, Lord. Keep me bold so that I can carry out the vision that you are calling me to carry out. A strategist is one who is skilled in strategy. is skilled in the art of planning operations so that he can accomplish his stated mission, managing and mobilizing all resources to achieve desirable goals. A strategist is a wise master builder, a wise master planner, and is an achiever. Such was Christ, and such was Paul the Apostle, and such were others who had Christ's spirit of wisdom in them. As we think about the ministry, we need to think, number one, about the man. Number two, about his mind. Number three, about the ministry. Number four, about the method. Number five, about the mastery. Number six, about the multiplication. When you think of a leader, that's a man. Well, that man, uh, when I say man, I'm using that in generic form. Could be a man, could be a woman. Somebody sent from the Lord. In John chapter 1, John chapter 1, verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. When you understand, you are the man. And you, you are sent from God. You are the woman. And you are sent from God to do the work that he has appointed for you to do. And you know that he will give you the wisdom. He'll give you the light. He'll give you the know-how. And he will give you the strategies you need to employ, you need to apply. Then you are able to stand with confidence. And you are able to look ahead and look at the vision. And you are able to see what the Lord has prepared you for. And what the Lord wants to accomplish through you and through your ministry. And then you see a line of other people. A chariot of other people. A train of other people. Lining up behind and asking you. What do you want us to do? Want to get involved in the vision. And get involved in the work. We want to achieve with you what the Lord has called us to achieve. And then you are able to direct them with the wisdom of of God was the strategy that the Lord is giving you to put in place so that the work can be done. A man must be available before he can actually do or before we can accomplish the work he has called us to accomplish. But what if the man is there but he doesn't have a mind? He doesn't have courage. He doesn't have boldness. And you know a person may be very wise a person may actually have a lot of ideas floating in his, high, in his head. And a person may have a lot of methods that you want to apply. The only thing is that his mind is not strong. He doesn't have the mind of Christ. And he doesn't have the mind that gives him boldness to move ahead and get the work done. He is uh, easily discouraged. And is easily disheartened. 
and is easily intimidated. And even though he has some good, good ideas, he doesn't have the boldness or the confidence or the self-esteem to bring them out. That's why as you think about the man, you think about his mind. In Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 5, Philippians chapter 2 verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Study the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and study the standing and the state of the Lord Jesus Christ and study the confidence and the courage of the Lord Jesus Christ and study the way that Jesus conducted himself and the way he composed himself and the way he stood erect and firm even before the people he knew were going to oppose his message that Jesus our Savior our Lord he had a mind that's our Messiah and we ought to have the same mind too that you'll be able to stand with courage and with boldness with wisdom with authority and with tenacity knowing that this is what the Lord has called you to do and you want to get it done now we're talking about the man and his mind and now the ministry Colossians chapter 4 verse 17 Colossians chapter 4 verse 17 and say to Archippus take heed to the ministry take heed to the ministry if there is anything that ought to be number one in your life is the ministry the thing that the Lord has called you to you're thinking about it you're dreaming about it you're strategizing about it and you are you're embracing it and you're going along with it you're associated with it and you don't want anything that will kick you out of that ministry or separate you from that ministry take it then to the ministry which thou hast received in the lord which ministry have you received from the lord a pastoral ministry take it to that a teaching ministry take it to that if you are called to a teaching ministry, how do you improve your teaching skill? If you are called to a pastoral ministry, how do you fulfill the pastoral ministry? If you are called to the children ministry, how do you exalt that ministry? Rejoice in that ministry, operate in that ministry, excel in that ministry. If you are called to the women ministry, how do you operate in that women ministry? That everybody can tell that it is your heart, it is your meat, it is your drink, it is your dream, it is everything to you. It's like a baby to you. And you are nursing it, and you are growing it, and you are developing it, and you are making it to be what it ought to be. If you are called to a youth ministry, remain in that ministry, appreciate that ministry, exalt that ministry, and sacrifice for that ministry. Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. That thou fulfill it. I think as you think about Paul the Apostle, he had the right to be able to tell another person, fulfill the ministry. You know why? Because he fulfilled the ministry. He fulfilled the ministry. You know, from the day that he met the Lord Jesus Christ on the, on the way to Damascus, until the time he gave up his very life, every day was filled with activity. Even when he was in the prison, he was still doing something and leading people to the Lord. And when they stoned him and they left him for dead, he rose up after the people, the believers got around him and he went to the city again I'm leaving for only one thing and that is the ministry. And when he was in the ship with about 276 other people, he will not be quiet even though he was a chained prisoner being taken to the place where he will be judged and maybe even executed did he know, but all the same, the angel of the Lord whom I serve. He was by me this night and he told me, Paul, don't care about anything that is happening. I've given you all these men that are with you. Every time, everywhere, he was carrying out the ministry and therefore a man that was fulfilling the ministry himself, he could tell another man, you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. How do you fulfill the ministry? That word, fulfill. Let me just uh, play on that word and divide that word into two. If I divide the word fulfill to two, what am I going to get? Tell me out loud. Full and fill. Turn it around. Fill it full. Fill it full. You know, if you look at your bucket of ministry now, uh, the ministry is just uh, at the bottom of your bucket. You have not filled it full. You know, the time of sleeping, cut it down. And the time of loitering, cut it down. And the time of just uh, discussing and gossiping, cut it down. And the time of just roaming about, cut it down. And the time of useless visitation, cut it down. And the, and the time of reading books that are not going to help you in the ministry, not contribute 
contributing to the progress of the ministry the Lord has called you cut it down and the time of going to the village during the holidays and public holidays cut it down and the time of going to see old friends cut it down and the time of just browsing aimlessly on the net cut it down and then all those times you have on your hand now bring it to the bucket of ministry and fill your bucket of ministry full take it to the ministry which you have received in the lord that you fulfill it and fill it full let your thoughts be on the ministry and let your ideas be on the ministry let your reading be on the ministry let your planning be on the ministry and let all your goings be on the ministry let all you, everything you are thinking about be on the ministry so that you'll be able to fulfill the ministry that the lord has called you to the man the mind the ministry the method the method when you're thinking about the ministry you are going to evolve methods you are going to develop methods that will actually get the work done in first corinthians chapter 9 first corinthians chapter 9 i'm reading from verse 17 why don't we start from verse 16 for though i preach the gospel i have nothing to glory of for necessity is laid upon me woe is unto me yea woe is unto me if i preach not the gospel he had no other thing to do. He had no other thing to think about. Only preaching the word and preaching the gospel. Verse 17. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. It says, everything I do, if you see me crawling, it's because I want to gain. I want to gain the souls. And if you see me pleading with the people, it's because I want to gain the souls. If you see me visiting them, if you see me a kind of a bending before them, making myself humble, a servant before them, I'm doing all that, not because I have to, but because of the ministry, so that I may gain the more. Unto the Jew I became as a Jew that I may gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain gain, gain them that are under the law, to them that are without law as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ that I might gain them, the word gain is very conspicuous here, that I might gain them that are without law, to the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak i am made all things to all men that i might by all means save some and this i do for the gospel's sake that i might be partaker thereof with you uh, can you see the picture of somebody the portrait of someone that filled his life and filled his time and filled everything he did he filled it full with the ministry the man the mind the ministry the method, the mastery. There are people that do not master the things they are called to do. They are jack of all trade and master of none. Isn't it better for you to identify the ministry the Lord has called you to and stop beating about the bush and stop wasting time on things that may be good, but those good things are taking the best away from you. And the good actually becomes bad when it hinders you to fulfill the very best the best thing you can do is to fulfill your ministry and to think about that ministry and see how you are going to do the work the lord has called you to do and if there are some good good things that other people are doing and they say hey come over here come and participate with us and do this with us it is good bring it let me examine it you look at it ah for me it is bad this good thing why do you say it is bad because it's going to take the best away from me anything that is going to take the very best away from me becomes bad useless worthless and unacceptable to me be a master over the thing the lord has called you to do and do it effectively in second timothy chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 5 second timothy chapter 2 verse 5 and if a man strive also strive for the masteries yet you see not crowned yet except a strive lawfully except a strive lawfully 
I, I told you about uh, Paul the Apostle and that he fulfilled his ministry. Look up here and pay attention, for example. You know, sometimes uh, you need to read the Bible intelligently and read it very, very carefully. I will see that when uh, Paul the Apostle went to the Gentiles, you know, after, after the Lord said, the Spirit of the Lord said, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have appointed for them. And they came out immediately. And then he saw that a deputy preaching to him and uh, the sorcerer wanting to make the deputy to be derailed or distracted from the gospel. And Paul, the apostle, manifested power, such power that the deputy had never seen. And that fellow gave his life to the Lord. And then they went to Paphos, went to the next place again, gentle world. And the people turned to the Lord. In that same chapter, the Jews did not accept the word of God. And it says, you've counted yourself unworthy of the gospel. We turn to the Gentiles. When the Gentiles had that, they came in their multitude. Then he comes into chapter 14. And he gets to, uh, to Lystra and to Iconium and all those, people, all those places. Even though there were persecutions. And yet the people turned to the Lord. Then he moved on. And then he came to Jerusalem. Do you know what happened in Jerusalem? Argument disputation and then in chapter 16 after they had written the decrees they wanted to give to the churches he went to the gentle world again and success began again chapter 17 Thessalonica and success began again and then I want to go to our people I want to go to the Jewish people and then when he got to when he got the even though he went to the temple and then he washed himself and did all that James and the rest of them wanted him to do immediately he got there Men and brethren, come and see this man. He has brought Gentiles in here because they saw he brought Timothy and Titus in. And then there was trouble. There were not many conversions among the Jews in the ministry of Paul. But there were a lot of conversions in the ministry of Paul among the Gentiles. Tell me why. Because the ministry, the gospel to the uncircumcision has been committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision had been committed unto Peter. When Peter rose up in Jerusalem and preached, 3,000 came to know the Lord. And then when he preached again, even though they imprisoned him, multitudes came to the Lord, another 5,000. And then again, and they were, to, were told that in Jerusalem, the shadow of Peter was healing the sick and people were coming to the Lord. Multitudes were added to the church in Jerusalem. Jerusalem through Peter but in Paul when Paul got there a great preacher a mighty preacher when he got to the Jews only knocks and beating that he had he was not successful did you get anything from that you can only be successful in the ministry the Lord has called you to if you are knocking your head against the wall and you're doing everything you think you want to do uh -uh. if Peter can succeed in Jerusalem I too I can succeed there I am going there don't go there if that is not your calling you can only be successful in the ministry the Lord has called you to and that's why we find the mastery master the thing the Lord has called you to concentrate on the thing the Lord has called you to and then we're going to have multiplication the man, the mind, the ministry, the method, the mastery, the multiplication. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 6. Acts of the Apostles chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 7. Acts chapter 6. Reading from verse 7. And the word of, the, the word of God increased. And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. It is the reason we come to consider the picture of biblical leadership. The strategist. As a strategist will come. And you know that the Lord has appointed you. The man of the hour. The Lord has appointed you to have a mind, the mind of Christ, and to concentrate on the ministry and to evolve methods that will make you successful in that ministry and then to master the things you ought to master so that the converts and the disciples will multiply and the church will grow. The church will grow in Jesus' name. We're coming to divide into three parts. Number one, the strategist's leading ministry. The strategist's leading ministry number two the strategic leaders must must s m u s t the strategic leaders must then number three the strategist leadership method 
the strategists, leadership method. I come to number one. In number one, we have the strategists leading ministry. As we look at the Lord Jesus Christ, he was the greatest of strategists. And he had a ministry. And he kept to that ministry. He remained with that ministry. He knew, this is my ministry. Other things may come along, but this is the leading thing that the Lord has called me to do. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. And now as he obtained a more excellent ministry. And now as he obtained a more excellent ministry. When it says a more excellent ministry, it's making a comparison. A comparison with who? A comparison with many. The angels had a ministry too, and Hebrews talked about them, but Jesus had a more excellent ministry. And Moses had a ministry too, and the Hebrews talked about Moses, and yet Jesus had a more excellent ministry. And Aaron had a ministry as a high priest. And the Hebrews talked about that. And yet Jesus had a more excellent ministry. And when you consider the personalities and the prophets that showed up in the old covenant, they all had ministries. But Jesus had a more excellent ministry. Wouldn't that save you from copying other people, other ministries, other evangelists, other preachers? other pastors, when you understand the ministry the Lord has called you to. And you know that this is a more excellent ministry. Even if there's nothing wrong with what the others are doing. That's the ministry they believe the Lord has given them. And you understand the Lord has given you a ministry. And you concentrate on that ministry. Isn't this going to, going to stop all the carnal competition there might be, even within the same church? Because I am called to the ministry for the children, and he is called to the ministry to the youth, and she is called to the ministry to the women, and he is called to the ministry of an overseer over a state, over a nation. And not only that, even two national overseers, he is called to the ministry of the nation, this other nation, but you are called to the ministry of the nation, your own nation there. Isn't, going to, isn't this going to save us from unnecessary competition? When you understand, I have a more excellent ministry. What I am doing now, where I am now, this is the best I could do. And this is the calling of God for my life. And Jesus realized that. And because he realized that, he knew that this is my ministry. The implication is this. If I don't do it, nobody else can do it. Think about what Jesus did. If he didn't do it, no angel could have done it. John the Baptist could not have done it. And any of the apostles could not have done it. And Moses and all the people of the Old Testament, Old Covenant, could not have done it. He had a ministry. And the Lord is telling us then, you have a ministry. If you don't do it, nobody else will do it. Now, as he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, confusion comes when the people that do not have much, when they exalt what they are doing, and they publicize what they are doing, and they promote what they are doing. And then you begin to feel inferior because you don't understand that we might promote something that is worthless. It's like uh, your boy or your, or your daughter, uh, you know, at school. And your boy wants to be, maybe he wants to be like an engineer. And then somebody comes to the school and somebody, uh, they are having career program or project in the school. And they're calling all these people to come and talk to them. And at home, you know, you've been working with your child and your child just said that I know, I understand. With what I can do with my hand, with the way I reason with my brain, and with the tendencies I have, and all the things I study at school, I know that I'm going to be an engineer, and that is the thing for me. And then they call all these career talkers, all speakers. They came to the school, and then the secretary, uh, you know, the one that is typing, and uh, you know, he comes and he says, you know, uh, when I, as a secretary, I want to tell you that you have a lot of 
uh, possibilities that you will never get out of job. In fact, you can be in the presidency. And what a wonderful thing if you will be in the presidency. Do you know that the person that is writing the uh, speeches of, and all the addresses and the messages of uh, President Bush in America, do you know that that fellow is like a secretary? Those uh, speech writers and all that, and that is something you can do. And then he gives this example and this example all of a sudden in promoting that thing that is not as actually great as you know being a, a, an engineer you know the your boy comes back home and says daddy i've discovered something i made a mistake before I, what i'm going to do now i am going to be a secretary and then another person also you know came and over there they you they called even because the teachers in the school they're feeling that not everybody will be a doctor not everybody will be an engineer or something and therefore they called the, the tailors and uh, so one tailor and this fellow is a communicator and this fellow can talk and it says um, everybody uh, look up here you know there is somebody you need every day. Who is that person? Somebody says, doctor, no. Did the doctor visit you last, uh, you know, last week? You, you don't need a doctor every day. And somebody says, uh, uh, an engineer. An engineer? Since when did you meet an engineer? We don't need an engineer every day. Now, all of you here, why do you need to come naked here? Ah, well, where are your clothes? You need the tailor every day. Guess somebody who will never get out of job is the tailor. And I'm here to tell you that the most important profession you can have is the profession of a tailor. And then he goes on and on and he paints a great picture. And then your boy came back home and your boy said, you know, mommy, I thought I was going to be a doctor. But you know, it is good to have understanding. Uh, somebody came and you know, exposed everything to us. What are you going to do, my boy? I'm now going to be a tailor. The point I'm telling you is this. You need to get my illustration. God has given you a ministry. And then there are other ministers that are coming. And they are publicizing their ministry. And they are promoting their ministry. And they are exalting their ministry. All of a sudden you just wake up and you say, what am I doing? Why am I bothering myself? And I'm concentrating on what I thought I will do. Now I know what I will do. This other one that has been exalted and being promoted, that's exactly what I'm going to do. And then your mind is changed. And you thought the ministry the Lord gave you before was a useless ministry, an, an insignificant ministry. That's the reason you need to identify what has the Lord called you to and stay on that ministry. Look at the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will save his people from their sins. And the Lord has committed a ministry into our hand. That we read about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 18. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, and all things of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given us, given to us the ministry of reconciliation. He has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. And you will sit and think through very well that the Lord has given you the ministry of reconciliation. And let's take, for example, you are in the youth ministry. In the youth ministry, what ministry has the Lord committed into your hand? Here we need to understand. You know, sometimes uh, we get so involved and so interested in this success, academic success, that you just you'll find sometimes there's a youth leader, and all he wants to talk about is academic success, academic success, and then the principles of success and the principles of studies, and all they're talking about. Whatever message you give that particular leader, he feels that the most important thing. With the young people, since we started say that is success academy for youths, a part, some leaders feel that that is the only thing to do. Have you forgotten the words of Jesus Christ? What shall it profit a boy? What shall it profit a girl? What shall it profit a man or a woman? If he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul. And what shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? Well, we might talk about success, but we're talking about success in a limited way. 
in a moderated way and in a reasonable way and in a way that will not contradict the real major reason why we get those youths together which is to lead them to the Lord the Lord has given us the ministry of reconciliation and then you, you find you know some of our leaders some of our men and they're encouraging our women and they're saying you know women I, I learned something from the headquarters we went to the headquarters and you know those women at the headquarters you know what they do they'll get those women together they'll tell them about uh, how to take care of their home how to take care of their husband how to cook good food and how to you know do this and do that and wouldn't it be wonderful in our state here in our uh, region here if the women fellowship and the women ministry they get all these women together how to take care of your husband and how to take care of the home and how to do this and how to do that isn't that wonderful it makes those men happy it keeps your home and it's going to make people understand that you know deeper life is uh, such a practical church oh yes that is true if that is all those women did that's not ministry that's not ministry i don't need the holy ghost to be able to teach all those women how to take care of their husbands how to dress and how to cook and how to do that that may be done but that is not the most essential thing what's the ministry he has given us the ministry of reconciliation Women have seen us too. All have seen and come short of the glory of God. And the women ministry is to talk to other women, influence other women, and bring them to the Lord Jesus Christ and reconcile them with God. Think about any other thing that we're doing. You know, about the language church. Sometimes we have those uh, languages and they come together. And the joy is just that we now have a church of our own. And think about it. This is our deeper life. As all the time, the, the church of the English people, educated people. And we know the fact that we even have our own church. And what are we doing in our own church? Just uh, uh, We need adult education. And in the adult education, you teach them the alphabets and teach them this and teach them that. That's necessary. That's all right. But if that becomes the preoccupation, is that our ministry? No. Adult education is not our ministry. And teaching them this, teaching them that, is a means to an end. That's not the end of the road. The real ministry is to reconcile the people with the Lord. And that's why you need to identify your ministry and understand this is what the Lord has called us to. Then you'll be able to put a good strategy in place and the work will be done. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 5 But watch thou in all things Endure afflictions Do the work of an evangelist Make full proof of thy ministry Do the work of an evangelist And make full proof of thy ministry The first priority of a strategist Is to identify his specific ministry you cannot go far if you don't identify and if you don't understand your specific ministry. The journey cannot begin until we know the destination. You know, somebody starts on the destination and is saying, I am going somewhere. You say, what do you hope to land? Well, I really don't know, but I, I want to start the journey. You know, a lot of time has been wasted and it's time I got started. No, you can't start until you know the destination. And what is the difference between ministries? I, I want you to look at some good people in the Bible. For example, Moses and Joshua. What was the ministry of Moses? And what was the ministry of Joshua? Were those ministries the same? No, not at all. Both of them in the old covenant. And yet, their ministries were not the same. What was the ministry of Moses? Bring out the people. What was the ministry of Joshua? Take in the people, possess the land, and divide the land to them. And uh, if you don't understand the thing that the Lord has called you to, you'll be doing the ministry of Moses, and then we're bringing them, but we have come out. And since we have come out, we're not going to take us in. Well, I'm trying to follow Moses. You follow the teachings and the doctrine because that remains the same. But the ministry is what we are called to. Can you consider the ministry of Jeremiah and the ministry of Ezekiel? Both of them were prophets. Is there any difference between their ministries? A lot of differences. Look at this. In Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. And let us see the ministry that the Lord called Jeremiah to. And it was very specific what the Lord said. In Jeremiah chapter, chapter 1. And I'm reading to you from verse, from verse 10. See, I have this day set thee over. What are the next two words? Tell me out loud. 
I caught you. I have not opened your Bible. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 10. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 10. Are you there now? See, I have said, I have this, they said thee over, what? Singular or plural? Plural. You need to understand the details of your ministry. And over the singular or plural? Plural. The kingdoms. And what was it to do? To root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down and to plant and to build and to plant. The Lord was very specific. That was the ministry of Jeremiah. And the, pecu the peculiar thing it was that he wasn't only sent to minister to the nation of Israel, to the nations and to the kingdom. And there was both negative and positive in his ministry. You know, sometimes you go on a guilt trip. What I mean is that you are not seeing your wound of guilt and condemnation. And the reason you are not seeing the wound of guilt and condemnation is you preach. Maybe you preached on holiness, or you preached on repentance, or you preached on restitution, or you preached on something, and then, you know, you laid it on the people. And then there is another preacher downtown, and very, very near. In his own case, he's always preaching on love, and the grace of God, and the mercy of God. And uh, some of the people, uh, they, they are listening to both of you, and they are comparing. And then they come to you, and they say, wouldn't it be, won't we make progress if uh, we just learn from what other people are doing? And we talk more of the love of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God and the peace of God and the gentleness of God and the kindness and the compassion of God. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could just concentrate on this other area rather than pulling down, throwing out, destroying, and all these other things that we're doing? Well, it would have been wonderful if we are called to that area. If that's our calling, that would be wonderful. And Jeremiah could not do that. Jeremiah could not copy another person because he had to know the details of his ministry. And he was sent to the nations. He was sent over the kingdoms. And it was spelled out very clearly. Root out. Pull down. Destroy. Throw down. After you have done that, build and plant. Let's do some counting here. One, root out. Two, pull down. Three, destroy. Four, throw down. That's negative. Then you have one, build, two, plant. Look at the ministry of Jeremiah here. And look at the four times it appears. The negative side, you have four times. And the positive side, what we think is positive. Only two sides. That's the calling that the Lord gave him. And the calling the Lord has given you is what you'll do. And now, deeper like Bible church, we have a ministry. And the ministry that has been given to us is in the word of God. And the emphasis of that ministry is evangelism as well as holiness. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Let the others do whatever they want to do. Let other churches preach whatever they want to preach. Let other ministries concentrate on whatever they want to concentrate on. But evangelism and holiness. Holiness and evangelism. Here is the calling the Lord has given every section of this church. And that is what we emphasize and we rejoice in it. We don't get, you know, we don't feel ashamed or feel guilty. Because, you know, the people want to accuse us deeper life. This is all they know how to do. Well, that's not their business. We know our ministry and we know what the Lord has called us to. And you concentrate on your ministry. Let's look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel now. In Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 17. Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 17. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto Tell me out loud. Again. How many nations? Just one nation. Ezekiel had his ministry. And that's the reason when you read the Bible. And you, what's your calling? What's your ministry? What has the Lord called you to? You don't copy Jeremiah. Neither do you copy Ezekiel. Jeremiah had his ministry. 
Ezekiel had his ministry. And here were told, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. And well, I've illustrated it to you very clearly that you need to really identify your ministry. Let's think about two other people, David and Solomon. David had his own ministry. There was something the Lord called David to do. And even though we know that Solomon was a son, yet the Lord called him to a particular ministry too. Do you remember that David could not build the temple or the tabernacle? And the Lord said it was Solomon that was going to build that. There are differences of ministries. Uh, there are two women ministers in the Bible. I call them ministers, uh, you know, using our modern language, Ruth and Esther. How about their ministries? Were there differences? Oh yes, a lot of differences between Ruth and Esther. And what ministry did Ruth have just to get married to Boaz and then to have a child and that child eventually will be the grandfather of David and David will be the great great grandfather of Jesus. Ruth, that's your ministry. You've done that. Congratulations. Well, you cannot go for your reward. I about Esther. Esther is not, her ministry was not to deliver a baby. And then that baby will be the, uh, will be the forefather, one of the forefathers of Jesus. No. But the ministry of Esther was to be able to save the Jews at the time of that difficulty in Shushan. The ministries are different. Therefore, you will identify what is the ministry. I just told you about Paul and Peter. Peter and Paul. And you find in Galatians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 7. In Galatians chapter 2, looking at verse 7, we're going to look at the difference between the ministry of Paul and the ministry of Peter. We're looking at Galatians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 7. But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was committed unto Peter. The same gospel. But one for the Jews, concentrating on the Jews. And then one for the Gentiles, concentrating on the Gentiles. And for Peter, it was the gospel to the circumcision. It was the gospel to the Jewish people. But for Paul, the apostle, it was the gospel to the uncircumcision. In verse 8, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision. The apostleship of the circumcision. Uh, uh, do you know there's some people that call themselves international apostle? They don't understand. They have not studied the Bible. Uh, they think that if you are an apostle in uh, Nigeria, you are an apostle in Africa, you are an apostle in America, you are an apostle in Europe, you are an apostle all over the world. And therefore they go about, it, they are not satisfied with just apostle. They must put international apostle there. And you follow those international apostles about, as they go to this place and go to this place, you find that uh, you know, they are not effective. I'm going to ask you a question. Why is it that, you know, a bonke comes to Nigeria and he doesn't go to Zimbabwe? Why is it that bonke goes to almost all the states in Nigeria and he doesn't go to all the provinces of Germany where he has come from? Because he understands where he is effective. And then he begins to sense, looks like when I go to this place, looks like that's where my ministry is. And then he may collect the money from America, collect the money from Germany and all those other places, telling them, showing them photographs and video clips. This is happening in Nigeria. You know, a million people are coming. 500,000 people are gathering together. He was in Calabar. He was at Ijebode. He was at Abokuta. He was at Ilori. He was here. He was there. How is it that he's coming to about 12 places in a year in Nigeria alone when there are many other countries there? That man recognized when I go to that place, Nigeria, they open the door for me. That that's my ministry. And Germany where I'm white and they are white, they are not going to listen to me. My ministry is not there. Why don't we understand? And why don't we understand there is no international evangelist and there is no international apostle. 
it is where the Lord has given you the ministry. He has committed the ministry of the Gentiles to the hand of Paul. He has committed the ministry of the Jews unto Peter. And when you understand that, you concentrate on your ministry. I'm reading from Galatians chapter 2, reading that verse 8 again. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty, uh, was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Uh, that is it. Uh, we thank God that we're learning this. Your ministry then will, develop, will determine your strategy. What the Lord has called you to. If you are called to the children, that will determine your strategy. If you are called to the women, that will determine your strategy. If you are called to reach to the language people, that will determine your strategy. The strategies are not all the same and the strategies are going to vary in line with the calling that the Lord has given you. I come to point number two. The strategic leaders must. The strategic leaders must. In fact, as you look at the Lord Jesus Christ and his ministry, you will see the use of the word must, M-U-S-T, in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the programming of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the strategic movement going about of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 42. Luke chapter 4, verse 42. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desert place. And the people sought him and came unto him and stayed him that he should not depart from them. And he said unto them, I must preach the, the kingdom of God to other cities also. For therefore am I sent. Do you see that? Must I must, I must, I must preach the gospel, the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom to all the cities also, because that is the reason I came. Have you discovered any must in your life? Have you discovered any indispensable thing, something that must be done? And you cannot negotiate it with anyone. It must be done. Have you discovered that your ministry? And are you putting that in place in John chapter 4? John chapter 4, reading from verse 4. And he must needs go through Samaria. Must. Must. Why? Because uh, verse 7. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee the living water. In verse 28. And we're told, And then the woman led a pot water pot, and went her way into the city, and says to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did is not this the Christ then they went out of the city and came unto him verse 39 and many of the Samaritans of the city believed on him for the saying of the of the woman which testified he told me all that ever I did uh, can you see here that uh, these, uh, the, uh, this woman got converted and many other people got converted because Jesus had a must in his life, in his ministry. In John chapter 9 verse 4, John chapter 9 verse 4, I must work the work of him that sent me while it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. There is a must in ministry and the strategist will know what is compulsory. And you'll know what is obligatory. What? You know, you can leave to chance. If there's time, I'll come to this. If, if there's time, I'll do that. If there's time, I'll get involved in that. But if there's no time, the number one thing that must not be forgotten, that must not be omitted, the most of ministry. Here it is, and I'm going to do it. And in John chapter 10, verse 16. John chapter 10, verse 16. And all the sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. That's a must. The Lord Jesus knew, although many people had turned to him, and many people had believed, and yet he said, I must still bring those other people that are outside, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold, and there shall be one shepherd. And now again, let's, let's look at Paul the Apostle. Acts of the Apostles chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. I'm reading verse 6. In Acts chapter 9, reading verse 6. 
it says and he trembling and astonished said lord what will thou have me to do the lord said the, and the lord said unto him arise and go into the city and it shall be told thee what thou must do go into the city and then when you get there pay attention when you get there don't just have an idea i'm going to preach yes you are going to preach it's not just me a preacher there are many places to preach and there are many people to preach to and there are many things to preach to but just pay attention and you'll be told what you must do and keep to that must verse 15 the lord and what the lord said unto him that's to ananias go thy way for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the gentiles and the kings and the children of israel he'll bear my name before the gentiles and before the kings that's a major part of his ministry and the children of israel the last part that came on there in verse 16 for i will show him how great things he must must suffer for my name's sake he'll go to those people that i'm sending him to and then i'll show him the things that he will suffer for my sake he must he must there is a must in ministry and that must in ministry you must take care of it you must note it very well so that it's actually done in your life and let's look at uh, acts of the apostles chapter 23 chapter 23 verse 11 and the night following the lord stood by him and said be of good cheer paul for as thou hast testified of me in jerusalem so must thou bear witness also at rome you must bear witness at rome and that means then we as children of god as ministers of the gospel the section the lord has called you to you're asking yourself what's the priority of this section and what is the thing the lord has actually called me to that i ought to do and you concentrate on that and that's the reason why even those of us who are leaders apart from us concentrating on the ministry the lord has called us to understand the people that have been given to you to lead and don't just move people about anywhere you know sometimes uh, we will find somebody that is working with the children's section and that person is intelligent is fervent is loving and is caring and it's a man maybe he's going to 70 years of age but the way he takes care of the children watch them at the time of the retreat and you know he wants to bring uh, the bowl of uh, meal he wants to serve those children and those children are hovering around him and then he's taking care of them and when it comes to teaching them the word of God and using the picture uh, books or whatever and all those charts explaining to them and their noise or whatever it is will not disturb him he's just at home with everything and then you, you just uh, you know, learn about him that he's a graduate not only that, he's uh, a responsible father of some children. Not only that, he's even in a very, in a work in a very good place. And you say, I want to reach the highly place in this community. Wouldn't it be wonderful? This uh, brother, I hear that he's very active and he's very loving and very kind. Uh, brother, please come. Uh, we want to do something. The highly place, even though we're not having IFL now, really as IFL, but we still want to reach them. Therefore, please come to that section. And then you give him a house fellowship in the uh, in this in that section, and you say, please go and lead. And you put outline in in his hand. And even though he's a graduate, and even though he loves the Lord, he comes there and then is fumbling. He doesn't know what to do. That's not his ministry. And then you check up on him, and uh, while you are talking to him, he looks like an unhappy man, an unfulfilled man. So what's the matter with you? I even, I exalted you, I promoted you. I'm giving you a greater work to do. All those uh, children, infants of a uh, primary school age that you are, you misuse language, that you are wasting your life on, you are wasting your time on, that's a misuse of, of language. I brought you to this important, significant ministry of consequence. If it's a misfit there, he cannot do it. That is not the ministry has been called to. If you want to help him, if you want him to be a happy man, a fulfilled man, get him back to the children where he has been working. If you need people to reach out to the highly place, get other people. They are there. Look for them. You'll find them. There is a must in our ministry. And it is that must we need to take care of. The word must is expressing a necessity, an obligation. 
a non-negotiable a compulsory thing that ought to be done and there is nothing to replace it in planning strategies something that cannot be left out overlooked or minimized is what we call a must were well, there not musts in moses ministry something so necessary that you ought to do that nobody else could do was there not a must in joshua's ministry now those ministries may overlap the ministry of this person here may overlap the ministry of this other person here but all the same there's going to be a concentration in what the lord has called you to do and then when you realize that must it's going to affect your language it's going to affect your attitude in romans chapter 1 romans chapter 1 i'm reading from verse 16 from verse 14 rather romans chapter 1 verse 14 i am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. He said, I am a debtor to the wise and to the unwise, to the barbarians and to the Greeks. Did you hear that language of Paul, that language from Peter? No, he didn't. Peter didn't feel he was uh, he was a debtor to the barbarians, a debtor to the Gentiles, a debtor to the unwise. That was the most in the ministry of Paul the apostle. So in verse fifteen, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at home also. For I am not ashamed. How could you be? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first also to the Greeks in 1st Corinthians chapter 9 1st Corinthians chapter 9 I'm reading there to you from verse 16 1st Corinthians chapter 9 verse 16 for though I preach the gospel I have nothing to glory of for necessity is laid upon me that's a strategist's must it's an obligation is compulsory it's a non-negotiable it's a necessity it's laid upon me for necessity is laid upon me ye woe is unto me if i preach not the gospel and so as you discover what your ministry is and you discover what you are called to do feel it full so you can fulfill it don't minimize it don't overlook it don't leave it undone concentrate on it and understand that you are a strategic leader with a must a necessity in your ministry i come to point number three the strategist's leadership method our leadership method and let's look at the lord jesus christ again and let's look at the method of the lord jesus christ in matthew chapter 9 i'm reading from verse 35 matthew chapter 9 verse 35 and jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people the lord jesus christ went to all the cities and all the villages he was teaching he was preaching and he was healing actually you need to understand the ministry of the lord jesus christ and every other thing he did was a means to an end never forget that every other thing that jesus did was a means to the end he was called to let me remind you once again in matthew chapter 1 matthew chapter 1 verse 21 and she shall bring forth his son and thou shalt call his name jesus for he shall save his people from their sins that was a calling that was the reason for his coming. That was the purpose of his ministry. That was his mission described right there. He shall save his people from their sins. If he was teaching, he was teaching them so that they will be saved. If he was preaching, he was preaching so that they will be saved. If he was healing and delivering them, he was healing and delivering them so that they will be saved. Make everything you do a means to an end. That is, you know the goal. You know the destination, you know the dream, you know the vision, you know the mission, you know the thing that you are to accomplish, the salvation of the people, and the steadfastness of the people, and the sanctification of the people. And because that is the end, every other thing you do, every other program you plan, will be going towards that line. That's the reason why you are doing what you are doing. Come back to Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35. And Jesus went about all cities and all the villages, teaching in their synagogues, 
and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Verse 36. And when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into the harvest. And then you come to chapter 10 of Matthew. In chapter 10 of Matthew, here is what he did in verse 1. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power over unclean spirits and to cast out and to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. He had been doing it alone. And then we're told that in verse 36 of the previous chapter, chapter 9, when he saw the multitude, he, was, he had compassion on them because they fainted and there were sheep having no shepherd and because of that he now sent out 12 people and these 12 he told them in verse 6 but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of israel and as he go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand heal the sick why are you healing the sick so that they understand the kingdom of heaven is at hand and the power of the kingdom is here and the demonstration of the healing ministry will make them to understand the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They ought to repent and move into that kingdom. Cleanse the lepers. Why are they to do that? To also announce that the kingdom is at hand. How many lepers have been cleansed since the time of Miriam and since the time of Naaman? Not many. And therefore, you heal those lepers, cleanse those lepers, so that they will know a new time, a new dispensation. The kingdom is right here. And then he told them, raise the dead and cast out devils. How many times were those things done in the Old Testament? Not many times. And when you do those things that didn't appear too many times in the Old Covenant, you'll be announcing to them, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Freely ye have received and freely give. Uh, can you tell in the Old Testament any 12 group of a group of people, 12 at the same time going out in many cities and the land in the Old Testament and the sick were being healed and demons were being cast out and the dead were being raised. You're not going to find any. Uh, you might find one Joshua that was able to do something because was trained by Moses. You may find one Elisha that received the double portion of the Spirit of God on Elijah. But to find 12 people all at the same time going to all the different cities and villages in Israel and doing all those things, you are not going to find too many people like that. And that alone, the number coming at the same time to all those cities and telling them in the land that the the people have been healed, it showed them the kingdom was actually at hand. And now through that, they'll preach repentance unto them. In Mark chapter 6, Mark chapter 6, verse 12, and they went out and preached that men should repent. They went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many devils and anointed with all many that were sick and healed them. And that was that was showed those people in Israel that actually the kingdom is at hand. As these 12 people are now seen to us and we want to get into that kingdom. And they have told us how to get into the kingdom. Repent. They preached unto the people to repent. Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, we'll see what Jesus did more above what he had done in Matthew chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 in verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and went and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself shall come. And again, he sent these people out to go and preach the gospel of the kingdom. Again, 70 people. Well, you will see the evolving of the ministry, the enlargement of the ministry, the extension of the ministry. And the same thing you are going to eventually. And let's look at uh, Acts of the Apostles. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10. This is Peter in the house of Cornelius. And let us see part of the message that he gave to them there. In Acts chapter 10, verse 40. 
him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be judge of quick and dead. And to him, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission, forgiveness of sin. Now, Jesus developed an ever-expanding kingdom strategy. Jesus Christ developed an ever-expanding kingdom strategy. He moved from the local strategy to a global strategy. He started with the lordship of the house of Israel. And then at the end, he said, go into all the nations. And then preach repentance in every nation. Begin at Jerusalem. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He began with the local. And then he ended up with the global. From teaching in the synagogues, he went to teaching in the open field. By the mountainside, by the seaside from the synagogue then he went to the open field from involving only 12 he extended to the involvement of 70 and then eventually he extended to involving all believers strategy from the little to the much from the local to the global from the church building to the open field crusade and from the church service to the retreat to the camp meeting or to the camping starting with ministry to the nation of Israel. Eventually, he sent the believers to all nations. The strategist's method is not static. It's not limited. It's not confined. The strategist's ministry or method should not be static. It should not be limited. It should not be confined. And that's why the Lord is bringing us there, telling us that now we need to get something done according to the calling of God upon our lives. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 26. Acts, chapter 26. I'm reading from verse 16. But rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of the things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee to open their eyes here is our ministry the people the Lord has sent you to to open their eyes to turn them from darkness to light and to turn them from the power of Satan unto God that they might receive forgiveness of sins underline that in your Bible the reason why we're opening their eyes the reason why we're turning them from darkness to the light the reason why we are turning them from the power of Satan unto God, the reason why we are manifesting, operating the gifts of the Spirit and manifesting the power of God in the midst of the people is so that they might receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me, that is, that is in Christ. Christ was talking to him. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Uh, the Lord is calling us to be strategists as leaders. And as strategists, you want to develop the man and the mind and the ministry and the method and your master, the ministry the Lord has called you to so that there will be a multiplication through your ministry. It has started already and we'll see the fruit of the blessing of God in your ministry in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Identify your ministry. You are the man, you are the woman the Lord has appointed. There was a man sent from God. His name was John the Baptist. You are a man. You are a woman sent from God. Don't pass through this life as birds pass through the air without leaving a mark. Do something. If you are the man, if you are the woman, take care of the man. Take care of yourself. Take care of your health. Take care of your mind. Don't expose yourself to unnecessary danger, unnecessary ill health. Sleep at the right time. Wake at the right time. Eat the right thing. 
take care of the man. The man needs to be strong, needs to be healthy. Be healthy, be strong. And then your mind. Don't allow anything that will weaken your mind, pollute your mind, destroy your mind. If the man is not healthy, if his mind is not sound, he cannot have a fulfilled ministry. Take care of your ministry. Identify your ministry. Appreciate your ministry. Concentrate on your ministry. Study to be effectual, effective in your ministry. Feel full, fulfill your ministry. Study the appropriate methods. If the methods you have been using have not fulfilled your ministry, study the appropriate methods that will fulfill your ministry. And be a master in your ministry. Be willing to be ignorant about many other things so you can conserve your time to master the essentials of your ministry. Trust God for multiplication. Remember, you are to train other people to fulfill their ministry too. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we've learned today. Thank you because you've raised us up as leaders. We're asking, oh Lord, you'll give us, grant us all the strategies we need, all the wisdom we need so that we'll be effective in ministry in Jesus' name. Fulfill your plan, your purpose in every one of us in the ministry. Lord, we'll pray at the end of time, at the end of life, we'll be able to look back. We'll be grateful to you that we have stayed on our ministry, concentrated on our ministries, and we have fulfilled the ministry. Let your hand be upon all your children. And we pray, oh Lord, your work will prosper in all our hands in Jesus' name. Thank you for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray.